Okay, thank you uh, very much for uh, inviting me to give this uh, talk. I'm very pleased to be part of this very interesting series of uh, talks that uh, has been organized. And uh, I'm going to talk about some applications of uh, geometric topology in, particularly in medicine and biology, but also to other problems in the general area of shape recognition, which is a very natural problem for topologists and geometers to look at, but it's had surprisingly little attention. So. Uh, the main focus of my talk is to introduce you to this problem and encourage people to think about the many interesting uh, potential applications for the work that we do. So, the, the main theme is that many of the problems that scientists look at are really asking about the geometry of two and three dimensional objects when you frame them correctly. And that it's powerful, it, that it's possible to use powerful geometrical and topological tools to, to investigate these questions. And I'll, I'll give you several examples in both of problems and of tools. But to start, before I get into the mathematics, I just want to introduce a sample problem for us to think about. Uh, which just illustrates the general kind of uh, problem that I'm going to be discussing today. And in the sample problem, we can think of some anthropologists who look at uh, fossilized bones and imagine that they've dug up some bone, and I show a picture of a typical bone that, that they might uh, look at. And it's... Uh, will be clear to uh, somebody in this field that this kind of bone is part of uh, the toe, part of the large toe of a primate. But what a, what a precise species it came from requires a tremendous amount of expertise to identify. So it might come from a lemur, a chimpanzee, a baboon. And moreover, if it's a fossil, it might come from an extinct species. So what we'd like to do is to understand which current species this most this uh, bone most closely resembles. And if you think about it for a minute, this is a problem in geometry. Uh, because we're working with fossils, we don't have genetics. We cannot get DNA out of these things. And the only information we have is the geometric shape of this object. And what we'd like to know is what currently known geometric shape of a bone does this most closely resemble? So how do we approach such a question? Well, I'm going to jump ahead. We're going to, I'm going to talk about a method we developed to answer this or to attack, to attack this kind of problem. And I'm going to show you some results that we obtained for an actual study uh, where anthropologists had actually obtained the bones of uh, the toe, these are called metatarsal bones, these toe bones. This is the bone that's right behind your, your big toe. And it's a good toe, it's a good bone to study when you look at species because uh, it's fairly round and tends not to be broken, unlike large bones are often fragmented or broken. And these bones tend to be quite uh, whole when they're when they're dug up in fossilized form. And so they're good models for, for studying and comparing different bones of different species. So in this case, uh, the anthropologist took 61 examples of these bones from a variety of uh, species of uh, new and old world monkeys and primates. And they uh, digitized them. They put them in a CAT scan, actually, and then created these uh, surface models of these bones, which were then able to analyze using computational methods. And I, you see here three, three examples of these bones. They've developed different shapes depending on whether these primates live on the ground or in trees and uh, what kind of uh, climbing they do and so on. So 
we know these bone shapes at the bottom for these various species, and then we have this mysterious bone at the top, and we want to know which of these known bones does this most closely resemble. And so the way we can mathematically formulate this question is, is it possible to define some kind of distance between shapes? So that given two shapes, and we'll have to say what we mean by a shape, but for our purposes today, a shape is going to be a genus zero surface. It's going to be a topological sphere with some kind of Riemannian metric on it. And what we'd like to do is to to find the distance between these two shapes, between any pair of shapes. So surface A at the top left, you can see we've actually computed uh, distance, which is in the numbers in this uh, in this uh, two by two matrix of distances. So we see that the distance between surface A and the known baboon toe, uh, the known bone A from, from a baboon is 0.16, while the distance from surface A to a lemma bone is 0.34. And that indicates to us that surface A is closer to a baboon than a lemma, more likely to be a baboon than a lemma. And surface B is closer to a lemma, it's more likely to come from a lemma than a and from a baboon. So a distance will tell us how much will be some a measure of how geometrically similar two shapes are. So we created such a distance by a method I'll describe a little later. And then we used it to analyze these 61 bones. And we were able to get this data from another study which was uh, published in 2012 in the Proceedings of the National Academy. Uh, one of the things the Proceedings of the National Academy does is, is require researchers to publish their raw data. So we were able to, to take advantage of that and run our methods on their data. They analyzed it by different methods. And we were able to compare how well we did with our mathematical distance based on geometry with the other methods, which I'll describe a little later. And so what we did was for these 61 bones, we computed all pairwise distances. So that's 1,830 distances. And these were computed purely by geometry and no no human expertise. We had no biologist, no anthropologist. Just using the geometry of the bone, we got distances between them. And then we wanted to see how well our distances did in comparing these species and accurately saying which species were related to each. So what we did was we used this distance to reconstruct a tree. And we compared a tree of where nearby vertices on the tree correspond to small distances. And then we compared it to the correct tree, which is now known due to genetics, the correct evolutionary tree. And I have a slide here which shows how we did. So if you look at this uh, tree, you'll see that the, the colors indicate indicate uh, individual, there were 61 individual bones here and they've been grouped by, by family in these colors. And you can see that the tree, which was reconstructed from the distances, which used nothing more than, so it's fairly standard once, one's ha once one has pairwise distances, this fairly standard methods of constructing trees. And that's what we used. We used a program called Philo Tree, which which constructs the tree out of distances. And the tree it, it constructs is very close to the correct evolutionary tree. There's, you see there's two mistakes. Two, two nodes of the tree have not been grouped with their proper, with their proper families. Uh, they've been grouped with some fairly nearby families. So this is considered a very, a very good result. It's, uh, it uh, uses just geometric information to correctly or very nearly correctly construct the relationship between these uh, species. So this is an example of a application. Now I want to talk about the general problem. 
and then about some the mathematics that goes into it. So the the problem, the basic problem can be considered to be surface comparing. You want to compare two surfaces, and it's it's a very important problem in many applications because everything we see in the world is a surface. Generally, we see the outside of three dimensional objects when we look at things. Occasionally, we see transparent things like jellyfish or glass, but most things we see are surfaces. And scanning of surfaces, it is digitized surfaces, is already becoming extremely common. The new cell phones have 3D scanners in them. Uh, hospitals are producing tremendous amounts of uh, images, MRIs and CAT scans and so on. And these are becoming, as MRIs become cheaper, they're becoming more and more prolific. Uh, in the near future, I think we'll see that every time you go to the doctor, they'll do a full MRI so that uh, they can look for, they can look for diagnostic indicators. So there'll be tremendous amounts of 3D data produced and the question will arise, how can we use this digitized data? How can we understand it? So one big set of applications is to diagnose diseases. Look, compare an organ like a liver or a kidney to a database of standard geometric uh, representations and look for abnormalities, maybe some tumor growing on them or some uh, bone fracture. So this is what's pretty much what's done by radiologists today. Uh, drug design, uh, you can scan proteins and look for potential drugs by understanding the geometry of proteins. Uh, I talked about the problem of recognizing bones and fossils. Uh, dentists can uh, look, look at scanned teeth and look for abnormalities corresponding to decay, for example. Um, animators want to take two images and morph them. And it turns out that a key step in this, again, is conduct, constructing an initial, initial correspondence. So the application here is you might have a person in two poses, say, sitting down and standing up, and you want to fill in intermediate uh, images. So all of these are related to this problem I'm going to talk about, and one lesson maybe from this talk is that you shouldn't uh, perhaps encourage your students to go into these fields because they're going to be perhaps replaced by computational methods soon. And uh, so there's many more applications. Uh, so one, one that I heard about after I started giving this talk a couple of years ago was an inventory manager at Siemens actually tells me that they often have the part that they often have the problem that they're looking at some machines, an old airplane engine perhaps, and they or or an old scanner, and they they have some broken part they need to replace, but they don't know what the part is. Uh, so they can scan the shape, and if they could look it up in a geometric database, they would know what what it is that they need to order. And uh, here's one more example. Uh, so psychologists have have what they what they call, are known as Rorschach tests. So they show you these pictures, and they've been trying to identify what these images are for many years now. So according to the psychologists, if you have certain type of troubled mind, a certain type of troubled mind, one of these object, one of these images might look like a person to you. Anyway, um, with good image recognition software and image classification, we might be able to finally tell the psychologists what it is that these images really are. That wasn't a that wasn't a serious application, but uh, it it just the serious message is that there are many possible applications, and they'll occur no, all over in many different sciences. Okay, so let me tell you about a traditional method for comparing shapes. So how would an anthropologist or biologist traditionally have compared two fish or two bones? What they would have done is turn a shape into what's called a feature vector. So if you look at the bone at the left, some expert, maybe a, a 
professor or a graduate student would have marked a collection of points on this uh, bone. Or they might have taken a collection of points on this fish. Uh, and so they create some standard collection of points which are easy for the experts to find. And then they produce out of these points a feature vector. And the way they do that is they measure the distance between some of these points. So here you see it for the bird. For a bird, there's, a, for example, the, the length from the back of the head to the beak is one of the points that they would measure, and the length from the end of the tail to the, to the end of the beak. So they'll produce a, a vector with a collection of numbers, and then the distance between two birds will just be the distance between these two vectors, in this case in R6. So you create, from each bird, you'll get a point in six-dimensional space. And the distance between two birds will be taken to be the distance in R6. So there's a big uh, literature of this kind of uh, measurement be being taken. It's called morphometrics. There's, they have their own journals and so on and their own, their own methods. And basically, this is a way of trying to define a distance between geometric shapes. And in some fields, it will work quite well. It will tell the difference between different birds and so on. But it has some drawbacks. First of all, it requires human expertise. It requires somebody who knows where these points are on each bird. And, and it takes, uh, takes someone to actually measure them, to physically measure them, which can be expensive and slow. If you think about having a thousand birds to process, it can take a long time to create these vectors. And you can make errors whenever humans are recording distances. And uh, as often happens when, uh, when metrics are con constructed in, sci in applied sciences, it's actually not really a metric. So you can imagine why isn't this a metric? Suddenly the distance between points in R6 is a metric, but this fails to be a metric for several reasons. And one example you might think, of, supposing two birds gave the same vector, right? So they happen to have the same lengths for these six, six quantities. That does not mean that the birds have identical shapes, right? Some other geometric feature might be different that's not caught in these six measurements. So you might have two, two different shapes whose distance is zero, whereas one of the properties of a metric is that if two objects have distance zero, then they're, they're the same object. So uh, I want to talk about next about another approach, traditional approach, not so traditional, but approach that's been used recently, which is machine learning. Uh, but maybe before I do that, I should stop for questions to see if uh, any questions about the introduction to the topic I've given so far. Uh, this is Ken in, in southern France. Um, Joel, uh, isn't there a question of scale also important here? I mean, it's more like a projective kind of matter, or is scale a critical issue both for the bones, let's say, relationship to age of the of the creature being looked at, or here with birds, you know, you get big birds and small birds. So that that's a that's a good point. Uh, so you have a choice when you do these problems of either considering scale or not considering scale. If you don't want to consider scale then it's easy to to get rid of it by just setting the area of each surface to be one. So you just scale each surface so that it has area one in your units. And then you're just sort of you're sort of factoring out a, the area the uh, the size of the object. And that's actually usually done because when you have different images on different machines, it's hard to know what the scales are uh, when you compare images. Uh, uh, and you you don't want perhaps some one machine is measuring in, in inches and another one in centimeters and 
some other one just in some internal machine scaling that it's hard to hard to know. So usually uh, in these problems, in the applications I'm going to show you later, we've scaled everything so that the areas are equal. But it, it is in theory possible to do it with scales as well if you if you want to. All these all these measures I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about will allow you to use scale if you want to. Other um, questions? Or? It's right. Uh, yes, it's Renzo here. I'd like to know uh, how do you do you know Minkowski functionals? Uh, these are used as uh, shape finders in uh, various contexts, in particular in cosmology, to understand relationship between mass distribution in the universe. Um, right. These are rather crude measures, uh, actually, compared to what you were talking about uh, and I want to know if you if you know them and uh, what what you think about that yes there's there's many measures the uh, uh, a typical one would be Hausdorff measure which is uh, that's right. essentially measuring uh, volume of overlap or distance between the overlapping surfaces and so on and there's there's many more sophisticated variations there's optimal transport uh, comparisons there's uh, things using Gromov Hausdorff metrics and so on so, uh, so which one is best for a particular problem depends on which problem you're looking at. Uh, and certainly, I'm not claiming that any particular method is best for all problems. Uh, one major difference between the problems is some of them use internal metrics, uh, intrinsic geometry, and some use rigid external metrics. So. I believe the ones you you mentioned, the Minkowski and Gromov uh, and Haus, Gromov, Hausdorff and Hausdorff, well, not Gromov, Hausdorff, but Hausdorff and Minkowski, they look at rigid motion to compare shapes. Whereas, if you want to compare a, a pair of dog, if you want to, for example, say whether something is a dog or a cat, the dog may be in many different poses. It may be sitting or standing and so on. So, the same dog or cat may look may look very different in, in an extrinsic metric, even though it's identical in an intrinsic metric. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll, so I'll, I'll point that out at James in a, a couple of applications later on. Thanks. So perhaps I'll, I'll move back to this machine learning example where, where a classical problem was now this is uh, this is actually a 2D problem, but it's still illustrative of the kind of uh, approach that people have taken. We can just ask: Does a photograph represent a dog or a cat? It's a very simple question, and here's some examples that you might look at. And people have now started looking at this problem using machine learning over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, this is also known sometimes as neural networks, deep learning, and so on. And and you can apply it to this shape comparison problem. So you can actually find things on the net, uh, sites on the net, internet, that uh, allow you to do this. And I'm going to go to this site in a second, and I'll show you how it works. Uh, this, let me just tell you a little history about this problem for dog or cat. So this was a big problem in computer vision to try and improve recognition of dog or cat. Back in 2007, the best algorithm, which was published in 2007, was right 56.9% of the time on photographs. And if you think about it, flipping a coin will be right 50% of the time. So this is not <laughs> this is not too much better than flipping a coin. Uh, by 2012, when uh, when people started using machine learning techniques, it imp the best algorithm was at right 92.9% .9 of the time. And today, with Google and Facebook having millions of images that are labeled cat or dog by people who have upload their, uploaded their pictures to the internet, the uh, algorithms are better at recognizing the difference between dogs and cats than, uh, than people are. But uh, let me let me show you how this uh, 
how this works on an example. So um, if I can. So here's an image of a, of a dog that's been dragged into this program and it's correctly indicated not only that it's a dog, but that it's a continental toy spaniel. Let me try and show you another example. So you just drag this image in. Okay, that was the one we just saw. There's another one. It knows that that's a Pembroke uh, Wells Corgi. So these are very good at telling uh, cats from dogs now. They're not so good when you lo start looking at other animals. So let's put a picture of a bear in. Okay, it succeeded there. We can try the Puma, it's the Canadian lynx there. But let's look at, uh, it's not, so for things that, that are have been extensively analyzed, these things are quite good at recognizing them. It thinks this statue of a bear is a camel. So it's not so good there. Uh, let's try it with some other things. Uh, if we take a teddy bear, it does recognize that as a as a plush toy. But if we take the the UC Ber the UC Berkeley mascot, it thinks that's a a person. Well, it recognizes that's a person. You could say that's a success. Let's look at some failures now. If you take this uh, this bear, it thinks it's a dog. If you think this, uh, take this teddy bear from UC Berkeley, it thinks it's a carnivorous mammal. So this, these, these are constantly improving. There's a lot of work being done in adding examples to these things, but they still have, uh, they still have a lot of uh, drawbacks in identifying things. Thinks this, uh, this uh, collect chicken is a brand muffin. Let's go back to, so let me show you why this is a challenging problem, uh, even for humans. So if you go to the internet, you can see that there's many shapes available, which are hard to tell apart, even for humans who have been trained to recognize the difference between images uh, evolved to do that. Uh, so, in the computer vision community, there's a collection of such uh, things. Uh, you try and imagine tr trying to program something to tell the difference between a between these kinds of image of a dog or a muffin, and there's many other such examples: cat or ice cream, dog or bagel. So these image identification problems will not be able to solve, to show the difference between these objects, dog or fried chicken. And one last one, dog or mop. These are challenging problems in computer vision and, and they'd be challenging for any approach you use for these kinds of problems. Okay, so when we, ask these questions, there's, there's actually two things we want to answer when, when we ask what, what is the similarity between two shapes. The first one, which I've discussed already, is what is the distance between a pair of surfaces? So if, for example, we have three objects here, three shapes, which we're going to be thinking of as three genus zero surfaces with each with a Riemannian metric, we, the first question we can ask is, which two, what's the distance between these pairwise? What's the pairwise distance? Which two are most alike? And the second problem, which is also very important for applications, is if you have two surfaces, which are fairly close, can you find a good alignment between them? So the alignment problem comes in, it's, it's in, uh, it's again, it's something that arises in many fields in imaging in medical imaging. It's called the surface registration problem. The 
the problem is uh, somebody maybe comes in for uh, an x-ray, maybe an x-ray of the liver, and two x-rays are taken six months apart, and two images are produced, and the doctor wants to align them to see if there's been any changes. Maybe a tumor has grown somewhere. But there's no natural way to align two objects. There's a translation and rotation group, the Euclidean isometries, and the two objects will not exactly align. So what's the best, what's the closest alignment? Finding the closest alignment, the optimal alignment, so you can look for differences is called the, sometimes the surface registration problem. It's a, a very difficult and much studied problem in, uh, in applied imaging. So these are the two problems we want to ask. What's, what's the distance? What's, how can we measure distance and how can we produce an optimal alignment? And the limitations of the machine learning method that I demonstrated in that uh, website are that you need large training sets, you need large numbers of examples of uh, each object taken in different poses and from different angles and so on. So you need very large numbers of, uh, of examples. You need, uh, it produces a, a problem, it produces a process for identifying things that isn't understood. So it might tell you that, the software might tell you this is a cat or a dog, but it doesn't tell you why it's a cat or a dog. So it's hard to tell if, it's, if you can rely on it. It doesn't give a method that, that it's understood. And this makes, uh, for example, medical people very reluctant to use these processes. And uh, it also doesn't produce an alignment. It might tell you that two objects are both dogs, but it won't give you an alignment from one dog to another, a way of taking one to the other and saying where they agree and where they, they don't agree. Uh, the first part of the question, needing large training sets, is a real problem because, for example, when you study proteins, you might only have a few images. It's very expensive to get an image of a protein from X-ray crystallography or other methods, so you may not have large training sets. Uh, so that, that can be a real problem. So I'll finally just want to ma make one remark. There's two approaches to the alignment problem. One approach is landmark free, and that's where you just use the geometry and no, no other information. And another one is landmark based, where you identify certain additional pieces of information. For example, in trying to align this bear to this lion, you might pick out the points of the ear and the points of the feet and try and only look at alignments to take ear to ears and feet to feet. And that, uh, in theory, would give you more a more powerful method because it would, it would for example, uh, stop some er erroneous alignments to take a foot to an ear, say. But uh, there are problems with these landmark methods. And just to illustrate them, I've made two errors in, in, this, in this example I've given of mapping a bear to a lion, there's actually two errors in that alignment. Uh, and one of the errors is that one of the feet of the bear is going to a tail of the lion rather than a, a foot. It's, it's easy to make such, if you can imagine flipping through and marking hundreds of images if you're uh, back in graduate school. And it would be easy to make occasional mistakes like this, which would throw off the method. And there's also another error, which is there's an orientation issue on one of the pairs of feet. So this can be quite quite uh, tricky to get this uh, done efficiently and without errors. Okay, so we're going to be looking at these at landmark free alignments. We're just going to use the geometry to try and compute the distance and and uh, an alignment of two surfaces. And we're geometric topologists, some of us. So the natural way we think of shapes is as stratified into, into their different genus, stratified by their genera. And uh, in each, in each uh, 
for each genus, there's different properties of the possible metrics that we can put on a surface. And whatever, whatever particular surfaces we focus on, we're going to need to have some mathematically precise notion of what's a shape, what, what's the distance between two shapes, and what do we mean by an alignment. So for today, I'm only going to consider genus zero surfaces. So this is enough to cover many biological shapes, uh, not all. Um, one interesting example of a genus one shape that you might want to consider is uh, a biologist who contacted us is studying the brains of a cuttlefish, which is shown, uh, shown here in the genus one column. And a cuttlefish actually has a brain that goes around its digestive uh, tract, so it's a solid torus. Surface is a torus. But human brains are more or less uh, represented by two topological two spheres, so we're going to stick to genus zero today. There are already plenty of interesting examples. So our first goal is to get some metric on genus zero surfaces, so some way of telling what the distance is between two such objects where the three properties of a metric uh, hold for this, uh, this uh, measure of measurement. And as I, as I remarked before, if you look at some methods that biologists have come up to measure how close things are, many of them don't satisfy any of these three properties. So the technique we're going to use, the particular technique I'm going to describe today, which is one of several methods that are, that have been used, uh, and they're not the only method. Our technique is going to be to try and find an optimal diffeomorphism. So we're going to take two surfaces, S1 and S2. They're both spheres topologically, but they're going to have different metrics, different Riemannian metrics. and we're going to use a distance based on how much energy or how much work it would take to stretch one over the other. So we're going to think of S1 as being made of rubber, and the second surface, S2, is being made of uh, solid metal. And we're going to stretch that first surface over the second rigid surface and look at how much stretching energy that requires. And that's going to be our measure, our measure of, this, of distance. So we're going to look in the space of all diffeomorphisms from one surface to the su surface one to surface two, and we're going to look for a diffeomorphism that's closest to metric preserving, that's closest to an isometry. And we're trying to we're going to make that precise. And the issue we're going to run into is that trying to find a best diffeomorphism in the space of all diffeomorphisms is a very difficult problem because the space of diffeomorphisms is too large. It's a, an infinite dimensional space, and it's very hard to optimize in an infinite dimensional space. Uh, many of the things you might try will run into this problem where you hit some local minimum and you can't find the global optimum. So the the idea we're going to use, which has been uh, explored by some other geometers, is to restrict the search for all, from all diffeomorphisms to a smaller space of diffeomorphisms, which is the conformal diffeomorphisms, the diffeomorphisms that preserve angles. So instead of an infinite dimensional space, this is now just a six dimensional space. And let me just uh, explain that a little bit. So conformal maps, if you're not familiar with them, there's different ways to think about them in different settings. But we should think of a conformal map as one that, that preserves angles. So a conformal map F from surface F1 to F2, here, here it's two proteins. This is actually the same protein uh, looked at from a different point of view. Um, a conformal map will be a diffeomorphism that it's not an isometry necessarily, it, it can stretch things, it can stretch distances, but it stretches them uniformly at every point. So the metric just blows up by some factor at each point. So if you look at two vectors, V and W, which are at some angle in surface F1, 
then those two will maybe be stretched in F2. Their images under this diffeomorphism will maybe be stretched or compressed, but the angle between them will be preserved and they'll be stretched or compressed by the same factor. So we're going to work with conformal maps, and the two questions we're faced with are, well, how do we know that there are any of these maps with these special properties? And if yet, yeah, if there are some, how do we find the best conformal map? What do we mean by best? And this question of existence of, of these conformal maps is, is a very classical study, a very classical problem that's been much studied. Uh, it's involved, it's closely connected to the question of finding constant curvature metrics on surfaces, which is called the, the uniformization theorem. And it's very well understood at this point. And in genus zero, which is the case we're talking about today, the uniformization theorem tells us a, a very powerful fact. It tells us that if you take any two shapes of genus zero, there's always an angle preserving map between them. So there's, there's only one conformal structure, if you like, is another way to say it, on, on genus zero surfaces. Given any two shape, like this pair in this bowl, we can find the surface to surface map from one to the other that preserves angles. In fact, not only can we find one, we can find many of these. There's a six dimensional family of such conformal map. So the, the technique we're going to use for finding a distance between two surfaces, and it's illustrated here between two proteins, what's the distance between this protein surface F1 and this protein surface F2, the, the algorithm we're going to use is we're going to use uniformization to find a conformal map from F1 to the round sphere, and that's what you see in the left column. And we're going to do something similar in the right column. We're going to find a conformal map from F2 to the round sphere. And then there's a well-known, it's well-known what the conformal maps from the round sphere to the round sphere are. Those are the Mobius transformations or linear fractional transformations. So by choosing, by choosing uh, among all the Mobius transformations M in the bottom row, we can construct, compose and construct all conformal maps from one of these proteins to the other. And that's what our algorithm will do. And then we'll have to, then we have the problem of how among the, all these conformal maps do we find the one that's closest to an isometry. So we'll need some notion of what it means to be close to an isometry. And what we're going to use is the stretching factor. So if you look at X and this green point X on the left and its image F of X on the right, these vectors, these little red vectors have been stretched by some factor, lambda, which depends only on the point X. So this conformal stretching factor, which is some function on the surface F1, is what we're going to use to measure how close this map is to a diffeomorphism. If, if this lambda is equal to one, then this map is an isometry, it preserves both angles and stretching and lengths of vectors, and that forces it to be an isometry. So surprisingly, this has not been looked at before because there's a, a very simple way of computing how far a conformal diffeomorphism is from an isometry, which is just to take the difference of lambda from one, square it and integrate over the surface, and you get a certain energy, which you take the square root afterwards, and you get a certain energy, which is a measure of this total stretching, and it looks asymmetric because we we picked one surface as the domain and the other surface as the target. But it turns out that this is symmetric. It doesn't no matter which, you get the same answer if you inter interchange the two surfaces. And this gives a, an energy which uh, which measures the total stretching, the distance from an, from a diffeomorphism, from an isometry. So we can take, if we minimize this uh, this stretching energy over all diffeomorphisms, we get a certain distance called the symmetric di distortion distance. 
And the theorem, which was proven uh, that as was proven in joint work of myself and Patrice Cole, who's a colleague of mine at UC Davis in computer science, is that uh, if you make this definition, you really do get a metric. And what's more, the the minimizer actually is realized by a conformal diffeomorphism. So this metric is realized by there's a there's a smallest distance, uh, smallest stretching conformal diffeomorphism, and that particular diffeomorphism gives us a particular alignment between the two shapes. So this is uh, this is uh, rather. There's some work needed to prove this. The space of conformal diffeomorphisms is non-compact. So you have to show a uh, minimizer exists, that the uh, minimizing sequences don't go off to infinity. And you also have to show that the minimizer doesn't develop singularities, but actually is realized by diffeomorphism. But you can establish that. So, so this gives a, a distance between two shapes. and. The, the mathematics is, I'll give reference later, but it's, uh, it's, it's not too deep, but there's some work to do. So the next question is, how useful is this? Uh, the hope is for applications that it will capture changes in shapes, but not be sensitive to noise. If some, if some measure is very sensitive to noise, it's not gonna be useful in real world applications. So I want to talk about an investigation of this in some real world applications. And in order to do that, I have to spend a couple of minutes talking about the passage from the smooth theory that I've discussed so far to the discrete theory. Because in application, shapes are described by triangulations, not by smooth metrics. So when you have an image that uh, that's being described in some, uh, imaging software, it's always described by some, uh, well, not always, but it's usually described by some finite triangulation that approximates the geometry of the surface. And this could involve hundreds of thousands of vertices. So in, uh, in this application, we need some notion of what it means for a discrete map, a map between PL triangulated surfaces to be angle preserving. We need to be able to compute these angle preserving maps and we wanna know how unique they are. So it turns out that uh, many people have, this, this, uh, have uh, studied these uh, discrete conformal maps for a variety of reasons. They're very interesting uh, for applications of different types and, and there's been a variety of methods Many of these have been implemented. I want to show you a quick example of a little program that takes a genus zero surface and maps it in an angle preserving way to a round sphere. Since UC Davis is a agricultural school originally, we will use a cow as an example. And Keenan Crane implemented a particular method of, of sending cows to a So I don't know if you can hear that. So this this actually did send the send that cow a, a discrete approximation of that cow to uh, try to a triangulated sphere in an angle preserving way. Uh, so Patrice Cole and I, in, in working on this, saw uh, what we discovered was that this is the key bottleneck for applications that. Constructing this discrete conformal maps uh, efficiently and uh, and robustly, so it doesn't break when you put in a bad triangulation, that was the most difficult single problem we have. And uh, Patrice is a expert software developer, so he's been working on a method to uh, to do this. And I just want to show you an example. There's a program called Map to Sphere, which will be available soon at uh, a website we've put up called discreteshapes.com. This will be freely available. And I made a little movie here of how it works. Uh, 
So what you do is you pick one of several methods. You first import a mesh, then you pick one of several methods. Here we'll pick Yamabi flow, which produces a, a discrete conformal map to the sphere. Uh, the initial map you produce doesn't uniformly distribute the points, so it looks uh, it doesn't look round. But when you uniformly distribute the points on the sphere, then you'll see you get uh, a nice triangulation, and the colors are indicating the the distortion, how close it is to uh, to conformal. So here's another example using a different method. So this is. Uh, this is now going to use a, what's called the conformal mean curvature flow, and it's going to take this cow to a round sphere. The final method, the final map produced, will again be conformal, and this is using a method developed a few years ago by Costa and Solomon and Ben Chen. So this works now very well, uh, very seldom uh, fails to work, and allows the processing of quite complicated geometric shapes uh, by these methods. So, uh, and not too long in the future, we'll actually be able to make available some software that you can use to load your own pair of surfaces and compare them using these methods that I'm, I'm discussing here. So, uh, this is another technical th part. When you, when you work with discrete surfaces rather than integrals, you'll work with sums over triangles. And this is the, rather than the integral formula for the distortion energy, this is the discrete formula that, that we use, which plays the same part for triangulated surfaces. So in, in the last five minutes or so, let me show you some, let me run through some applications and experiments we've done. So that application, the simplest shape question you can ask about an object is how round is something? So you can take this cube at the right and measure its distance from a, from a round sphere. So we did we did this uh, how round question for uh, this roundness question, how far is something from a sphere for a variety of shapes. Here's uh, the platonic solids. So as you as you might imagine, the tetrahedron is the least round. And uh, you can, depending on which which other measurement of roundness you use, I, there are certain standard ones like in, looking at inscribed spheres and looking at isoparametric ratios. Uh, there's different ideas of which ones are most round, but uh, if you look at our distance, you'll see it on the vertical scale here. The tetrahedron is least round. And for our purposes, the uh, dodecahedron is the most round. An another set of experiments we looked at was ellipsoids. How round are ellipsoids? So you can take an ellipsoids with two axes equal to one and the other axis equal to A. A runs from one over 100 to 10 on the horizontal scale in this graph. And what this shows you is that if you go, if you squeeze a, an, a sphere into an ellipsoid where one of the axes is going to zero, so you're sort of limiting to a disk in the plane, then the distance is converging to about 0.4 on this scale. So initially you get quite a bit of energy required to squeeze a sphere. But once it's very flat, you need very little energy to squeeze it completely into the plane. On the other hand, when you stretch an ellipsoid and get in a cigar-shaped, uh, cigar-shaped uh, ellipsoid, you more or less uh, linearly, well, this is a log scale. So you you increase the uh, you increase the uh, distance linearly on this scale up to a certain point where it's about uh, 10 times, where one axis is 10 times the other. What happens then is we used a, a mesh of about a thousand vertices for this experiment. And once you get, once the ellipsoid becomes too needle-like, it's, it's endpoints to squeeze between the vertices of the ellipse and uh, the mesh is no longer representing the shape. And that's what you see on the far right of this picture. 
this is an experiment that looks at noise. It, uh, it's essentially asking how round is a sphere when you start adding noise to it. So noise is just Gaussian noise. So you randomly perturb the vertices of, uh, of this uh, mesh which lies on the sphere. And the size of the perturbation is, uh, is compared to the average edge length of the mesh. So if the perturbation is, is less than say half of the average mesh uh, length, half of the average edge length of the triangulation, and then there's very little effect on the roundness. It takes uh, quite a large perturbation before noise starts affecting the distances between two shapes. So this is a good feature. Noise is not uh, critical in measuring shape. And another nice feature of this, uh, of this uh, description of sh shape distance is it's independent of the, of the uh, mesh that you use. When you re-triangulate or subdivide a triangulation, you don't get uh, you don't get significant changes in distance. I want to move on because I, I want to show you some biological applications. So uh, we did some experiments with the surfaces generated by proteins. So these are surfaces of the proteins when represented as unions of solid atoms as shown at right. And uh, we did an experiment. We got have a date. We found a database of 530 or so proteins, and we measured how round they are. And you can see the results here of these uh, particular proteins, where we had uh, had good meshes for their uh, molecular surfaces. Most of them tend to congregate around fairly globular, roundish shapes. And uh, you can see the, the shapes here of the most round protein at, at the top left and the two least round proteins. And you can see these two, these non-round proteins have uh, sort of uh, long arms that stick out. So, so this, this is just a rough indication that this is picking up something of the shapes of proteins and how globular they are. The, uh, let me finish with an application to brain cortices. So neuroscientists want to align pairs of brain cortices in order to measure their similarities and differences. And they, when they do so, they think that these uh, a good alignment occurs when these principal sulci, these valleys which separate pieces of the brain, uh, align fairly well. So we were able to take images of brain surfaces and automatically align them. So they were aligned by this energy minimization distortion distance without any human expertise. Uh, not Nobody told the, the uh, alignment to align the brain in any particular way. But as you can see in these pictures, the, uh, it sends one subject one, one's brain to subject two's brain in such a way that these do align fairly well. Uh, you can't align them exactly because these sulci are not precisely the same. They're not even the same topologically in different humans, but we actually did a a comparison of how accurately these were, how accurate these are at, at aligning these sulci on a database of about 40 brain surfaces, which was made available at UCLA. And we compared our method in a paper that appeared in a neuroimaging uh, conference with uh, two standard methods that are used in the brain alignment community, free surfer and spherical demon. And I'll just finish with with this slide. So this shows our method is on the left. It's the vertical white bars. Lower is better for, this is a blow up of the previous slide. Lower is better. And you can see that our method does as well, roughly as well on these tests as free surfer and spherical demon. These are, these are uh, software methods which are developed by with NIH grants by large numbers of uh, software engineers uh, working in medical imaging. And they have input, they have landmark input. So a lot of human expertise went into making their alignments. And we did approximately as well with no human input at all. 
just using geometric descriptions of the brain surface. So there are other other collection other experiments were done on bones and teeth, and again we did it about as well as the best software or human experts in these in these fields. And and this last slide is just indicating that we are using intrinsic geometry, so we should be able to recognize objects that flex as being the same. So proteins and animals that move and so on are are the same object in different poses, and, and this this method will show that these are the same objects uh, in principle. So thanks for listening, and here are some of the uh, places you can look if you want details. So Are there any you. questions? Yeah. Uh, hi, Joel. I'm Jesus from Timat, Guanajuato. Hi. I just wanted to ask you, um, so all this uh, algorithm works for only for 3D, 3D images, right? So you need, to, you need to have your image digitalized in a 3D object. So it doesn't work for pictures, right? For if I have a picture of an object, a 3D object is not going to work, or there is nothing uh, to say about that. Yeah, so this particular image, you're absolutely correct, uh, takes as input a 3D representation of a surface. But it, it doesn't really require it to be embedded in R3. What it requires is a triangulation with distances assigned to each edge. So. Uh, oh. So, you know, there are surfaces that don't embed in R3, uh, hyperbolic surfaces, for example. So it, it will work for those. Uh, but the medical data, for example, is all comes from surfaces embedded in R3. Uh, image recognition for photographs is, uh, is a different problem, really, although related. And this method won't work for those. And, 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 and another question. Um, uh, how expensive is this method uh, in, term, in terms of computer um, software? How, how long it takes to compute the distance between surface and how? Um, uh, well, and what is the complexity of the algorithm? Right, so the, the complexity, there's sort of two parts to this. One is computing conformal maps. Uh, and uh, Part two is computing the optimal conformal map, finding the minimum one. So the second part, it's certainly, uh, if you have uh, n points, n vertices in your triangulations, it's uh, it's certainly a polynomial, maybe n cubed or n to the fourth, which uh, in worst case, which uh, in practice is not very good because you're looking at, if you're looking at 100,000 points, then n cubed is not a practical uh, computation time. However, you can, in in practice, you can approximate approximately find the optimum very quickly in the cases we've looked at. Uh, we don't have a theoretical guarantee that we're finding the the optimum, but uh, you can in practice get what clearly isn't uh, very close to the optimum very quickly. And these conformal maps, uh, uh, it the they're in practice very, they they involve, uh, much of it involves just solving linear systems, which is very, very fast. Uh, it it looks like, or, or minimizing in convex uh, optimization function. So it, it, it looks like uh, when it, when it's working, it's it's not a big time problem. It, it it seems like it should be, it should be possible to, to make these things operate very uh, quickly in real time. But I, I don't have any uh, theoretical uh, answer. I don't have any rigorous answer to what the complexity is at this point. Um, well, thank you very much. That, that answer was okay. For, was enough for me. <laughs> That's enough for me. Uh, yeah. And as I said, your work is amazing. I, I really thank enjoyed you. your talk. Thank you.